Hey everybody, this is Matt here with The Curbsiders. Quick announcement before the show. As you know, we pride ourselves on having high quality audio here at The Curbsiders. Unfortunately, this week we had a little bit of an issue. There's a little bit of uh, extra noises at some points during the podcast. We thought it was still extremely high value content and very listenable, so it's in there. I just know we're getting a lot of new listeners these days and I don't want them to think that this is our are the best that we can do. We are putting some things into place to try to make sure that we do better on future episodes. So thank you for bearing with us and enjoy the show. This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by ACP's Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Program, MCSAP 18. MKSAP 18 is a comprehensive learning system that meets physician needs for high-quality learning content and individual knowledge assessment. So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. Just visit www.acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. The Curb Siders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For more of the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those, and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs. If indeed there are any, in fact, there are none. Pretty much we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're right. Okay, audience, I ju- I'm saving you from whatever voice Stuart just did. Welcome back to the Curbsiders. This Hi, is Doctor. <laughs> Hi, Stuart. This is Doctor Matthew Frank Watto here with the great Doctor Stuart Brigham. That's kind of me. <laughs> I just he just did some crazy voice, which I refuse to put on air, and I know Paul Williams is high fiving me from wherever he is. Unfortunately, he's not here tonight, but we have with us. A, uh, a frequent writer and producer for the show and now b- appearing with us on air for the first time, Nora Toronto. She is a chief medical student uh, at the University of Chicago. Is that right? That is, though I'm not sure anyone knows actually what that is besides the you Chicago folks. <laughs> yeah, I had never heard of it before, so I still question whether or not it's real, but I haven't bothered to check. <laughs> I just have a lot of power. That's all you need to know. Okay. Well... <laughs> Stuart. Kind of like class president or something like that. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Before Nora starts like, you know, taking over the whole show, Stuart, why don't you tell the audience, in case we have some new people, That's what right. what is this show about? What do we do on so, the show? In the vein of Paul, I'll tell you what we do. We uh, So this is an internal medicine podcast. We tend to use expert interviews like today to bring you clinical pearls and practice change knowledge. Um, in the... Uh, in the air of full disclosure here, we do tend to kind of talk about things that aren't necessarily related to the topic at hand. So if you want to skip ahead, like Paul says, and be worse off for it, go ahead and skip ahead. There's uh, timestamps just for you. Just for you, Paul. <laughs> right. That's right. We put timestamps in our wonderfully done show notes, and you should definitely check those out uh, either, either right after you... Uh, listen to the show and then maybe a week or so later just to make sure that the information is going to stick. Uh, Nora, why don't you tell them what, what they're going to be learning about on tonight's show and why we decided to do this topic. So I'm really excited about this episode. Um, we are bringing Dr. Dallas Reed on to talk about genetic testing to all of you. Um, We are in this era of personalized medicine where um, you can get tested and treated for things kind of in an increasingly unique, personalized way, and genetic testing is a big part of that, we think, but we really don't know, many of us, the direction of that within kind of internal medicine and within the internist practice specifically. Has it realized its full potential? Has it... um, do we have tests for everything we want? The answer right now is pretty much no, but there are some things that we can definitely test for. So we have Dr. Dallas Reed, who's a reproductive geneticist, come um, and talk to us about what kinds of testing we can order, when to refer for genetic counseling, which is basically all of the time, (laughs) and uh, what sorts of uh, tests we may be able to see in the future. And of course, we ask her about the di- the whole direct-to-consumer thing. Yes, yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll get her answer to that, yeah. 
Dr. Dallas Reed is a graduate of Boston University School of Medicine and Dillard University in New Orleans, Louisiana. She completed a residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Bridgeport Hospital in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and her fellowship in medical genetics at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Dr. Reed joined Tufts Medical Center in 2016, where she is an assistant professor and director of perinatal genetics at Tufts Medical Center in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and at the Floating Hospital for Children in the Department of Pediatrics and the Division of Genetics and Metabolism. She is course director for the first year genetics course at Tufts University School of Medicine. She's a member of the Tufts Medical Center Physician Organization Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Her clinical interests include obstetrics, general gynecology, perinatal genetic, prenatal genetics, preconception counseling, genetic disorders in pregnancy, and cancer genetics. We had a very wide-ranging discussion. Uh, it is a great first episode on genetics. We go kind of over the basics and then over a standard case. So I think you guys are going to love it. So without further ado, here's our discussion with Dr. Dallas Reed. Did you just say floating hospital? I yeah. love that. I, uh, I, I wish I worked at the up. floating hospital. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, yeah. I, I'm thinking something in the sky, like <laughs> castle in the sky. No. I got very yeah. excited that it was on a boat, but it is not. It's the children's hospital at Tufts. <laughs> I can't believe it. Floating hospital. I wish I worked there. Dallas, thank you so much for joining us. And the first question we're always going to ask you is, can you give us a one-liner about yourself and make sure you include something like outside of the world of medicine about yourself? So uh, I'm a 36-year-old OBGYN geneticist. I was recently married in um, over Labor Day weekend. Um, I identify as a multiracial woman who enjoys watching football and golf. I like meeting new people and traveling the world. Football. So is your team still in the playoffs here? And congratulations on getting married too, by the way. Thank you. My team is not still in the playoffs, probably like your team. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Our next question to get to know you a little better is, what is a book that every physician should read? So there's two that I would say that I think were very enlightening, The and the, I think both are pretty popular. Um, one is The Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of that book. I think they made a movie out of it. Um, It is about the woman who uh, was treated at Johns Hopkins. She had cervical cancer and her cells were biopsied against her, not against her will, but without her permission. And those cells have gone on to be the cells that never die. And they're essentially sold all over the world, um, used in all types of research for everything you can imagine. And companies have made lots of money off of it. And her family was a very poor family in Baltimore. Um, and never really saw the the benefits of of her cells. So it, wow. it brings up a lot about ethics and about um, about you know asking permission and getting permission and um, you know about racial issues and socioeconomic issues. It's a very good book. Um, Rebecca Sclute essentially sort of stalked this family for a very long time. They were very hostile to um, Johns Hopkins and anybody looking into this story. And um, it's a really amazing book. So that's one book. I know you have- Yeah, I actually actually read it um, when I was just starting to do work with HeLa cells, which are the Henrietta Lacks cells. Yes. Um, and I was a history of science major. So it like, it's an amazing piece of writing and research. The second book, I read, I think, before medical school, potentially, um, when I actually had time to read things that I (laughs) enjoyed (laughs) reading. Um, So it's called The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down. I don't know if either of you have heard of that. It's called, it's by Anne Fadiman. um, And that book is about this uh, Chinese family whose daughter, I think she has seizure disorders, epilepsy. And they are from a culture that's very isolated in China and come to the U.S. and get care here. And it's just about the cultural differences and the misunderstandings that happen um, when you don't understand someone else's culture and, we, and when we sort of talk to people from our medical perspective. So it's a really excellent book as well. Um, 
I read that one a long time ago, but I probably should read it again. It's now that I'm a physician and doing this, I think I'd probably learn a lot again. It sounds good. I it, Both those books sound very familiar, and I'm sorry to anyone who has previously potentially recommended them on the show, but I just can't <laughs> even remember. Actually, my wife is just put together, at, with the help of a listener, a list of like all the stuff that's been recommended on the show, and it's a pretty sizable list. We'll be posting that soon, maybe even by the time this airs, and we will, we will add these books to that as well. Um, Stuart, did you have any questions? Yeah, what... So the the question that I typically ask is, what do you feel is the best advice that you have received as a scholar, physician, learner? Wow. That one, I think, is a hard question to answer. Um, I think what I think about most is related to um, residency training, since that's such a difficult time. And something that I feel like I was told and now I tell my residents is that as an intern, when you walk in the door, you essentially know nothing. Um, And that can get you into a lot of trouble. Um, But if you're efficient with what you do and your time and like how you sort of move through a case. So in my residency, for example, we have patients, pregnant patients that come into triage. Um, triage is usually a small space. It's usually two beds, three beds, five beds. It's like a little ER for the pregnant patients. Um, if you can get a patient in and out of triage quickly, um, the nurses really like you (laughs) (laughs) and, and it's just about being organized and knowing like when to group tasks together so that you're not in and out of the room, in and out of examining the patient, et cetera. So I'd say find a way, get tips from your older residents or from other people. It goes as a medical student too, impressing your team by being efficient with what you're doing. And eventually you'll learn all the things you need to learn too, but people really like you and think you're you're really smart and doing a good job, even if you don't know anything, if you're efficient. I would say, and and if people think they're not efficient, remember we talked about like the whole um, growth mindset thing. Just be like, I'm not efficient yet. And you can you can definitely train yourself to be efficient, especially yeah. if you're asking people who are doing a good job at it. You can, you can definitely learn that and at least get better than you are currently. So that's great advice. Nora, why don't, why don't you go first? Did you have any sort of like pick of the week that you wanted to give before we move on to the main topic? Oh, sure. Um, so my pick of the week is a cooking blog that has blown up in the last couple years. And actually there are now two cookbooks from the Smitten Kitchen cooking blog. Mm. And I love it. It's, I, I, I haven't had a single bad recipe come out of this cooking blog or the cookbooks that, um, the Deb Perlman, uh, the author has published since, So I highly recommend it. They're not hard recipes by and large, and they're like relatively healthy and always really, really delicious. I I don't do much cooking, but I'll maybe I'll check it out. (laughs) Just my eating. My wife's birthday is coming up in the near future. I probably should I probably maybe I'll surprise her and cook something. So I just made a great, really easy confetti party cake from this blog that's like a funfetti cake out of a box but just slightly actually a lot better okay so Ooh. potentially worth considering <laughs> i i do love funfetti yeah i don't even know what that is <laughs> it's it's the <laughs> it's like some sort of cupcake that has the different yeah. color uh sprinkles sprinkles yeah. in it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, and then you sprinkle <laughs> sprinkles on top of the icing. You said ah. you were an yeah. eater. Yeah, cool. yeah, I am, but I, 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 I don't know what fun is. You have is. five kids, and you don't know what fun fetty is. No clue. They no clue. They're not allowed to have sugar. Maybe we'll get them. To, yeah, maybe we'll get maybe them to much. sponsor a future show, Stuart. No, that that would not be good. <laughs> I would put the kibosh on that. <laughs> All right, uh, my uh, th- this is a pick of the week. This isn't for a specific thing des- necessarily, but it's just something that I've been <laughs> like uh, jump ropes. It's like jump ropes. This this is for Paul Williams, who's not here, but this is, mm. I've recently gotten back into morning routines, and this is something that takes me 15 to 30 minutes, but I it's something I look forward to each day, and it's usually a combination of things where I just basically try to like wake up my mind and body doing some sort of exercises. Uh, it could be writing in a journal. It could be like just sitting and following my breath or uh, reading reading something doing like a set of push-ups or squats or something like that. 
And uh, I find that it makes my, it, it sort of like primes me for the day and in a good way where I feel like I've at least like had control of something, even if I'm walking into like tons of patients and, you know, madness uh, at my job. So I would recommend people try to think about their morning routine and not just like rush out of bed with like mismatched socks and like <laughs> spilling their coffee on themselves. Like What's wrong it, with that? It, it feels good. <laughs> it feels good if you have this kind of start to the morning. So people should check it out. Hmm. Make your bed. That's what I've been told. Uh, yeah, that's that was, was Admiral McRaven. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you that, if you make your bed in the morning, you start off with a win, right. and it sets you off on the right path. This this is part of yeah. Sometimes I make the bed, but you know, if your partner's <laughs> sleeping in the bed, it's kind of hard to make. The bed. <laughs> <laughs> Just kick him out of bed. I gotta make the bed. Yeah. So so sometimes that's an option. Sometimes not. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, Stuart. Anything you had before we move on? Um, yeah. So w- one thing I wanted to recommend, so I love Studio Ghibli. If you don't know what that is, it's one of the, uh, um, it, it, one of the, uh, companies that makes a lot of well-known anime movies, specifically anything by Hayao Miyazaki. Well, they, they partnered with uh, Studio 5 to make this, uh, it, this came out in 2011. It was a PlayStation 3 game called Nino Kuni, which is really heartwarming, really cute. The second one that I've been playing sucks, but the first one's amazing. <laughs> So the ones the ones on PS4 just sucks. Avoid it like the plague. But the first ones on PS3 came out in 2011. is really awesome. Before we get to the rest of the show tonight, Paul and Stuart, uh, I believe we have a sponsor. Paul, did you want to tell us a little bit about that? I would love to. We are lucky enough to be sponsored by MKSAP18, uh, which is brought to you by ACP. It is a great tool for a variety of learning needs. I personally would not have passed the boards without it. And then it is also... Uh, great if you just want to pursue lifelong learning or use it as a reference um, or for helping other learners that you supervise. And then as an added bonus, it's great for nice chunks of both CME and MOC credits. I was like shocked by how many CME credits I got when I finished. <laughs> it's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. You can get it in either print or digital formats, but we highly recommend the MixUp 18 Complete because it's got the best value. It has everything you could possibly think of, the digital flashcards, board basics, virtual diagnosis, and the print. Frankly... It's all inclusive. Yes, it is, Stuart. To echo what Paul was saying, MixApp, uh, I went through it a couple years ago when I was taking boards. I think I did MixApp 15 and MixApp 16. And I'm actually the kind of nerd that enjoyed going through all the questions and like seeing what I did and didn't know. I found it tremendously helpful. It's definitely a good way to like consolidate all the learning that you've done uh, and make sure you actually know what you're talking about because just passively reading is not as effective as doing the questions to actually test your self-knowledge. That's right. And Matt, did you know that there's also a money-back guarantee if you, for some reason, happen to not pass the ABIM exam? (laughs) Uh, I did not know that, Stuart, but that is actually good to know because there is a decent chance that I will not pass on the next try. (laughs) Lemire syndrome. (laughs) (laughs) So whether you want to be prepared for your exams or just enjoy lifelong learning like our own Dr. Watto, MKSAP 18 is the way to go. We recommend you check it out. Just visit acponline.org forward slash MKSAP to get started. Well, with that fantastic recommendation, I want to I want to see if I have this have this uh, just from like a, a macro perspective. You have your genome. We have how many chromosomes again? I'm not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> 23 oh, pairs. 46 total or maybe you can maybe you can step us through it from the top down that might be the easiest can you step us through can you take us from like the broad chromosomes down to the macro level and that might help me kind of understand this testing a little better sure so uh when you look at the nucleus of the cell so that's you know as big as it gets when you're thinking of genetics right it's still submicroscopic but it's big Um, You look in the microscope, you look in the nucleus, and there you see the chromosomes. So that's sort of the biggest package of DNA that's out there. So the chromosomes, essentially the DNA is split up into these 23 pairs of chromosomes. So uh, each pair has a complete set of your DNA, and the two together complement each other. So all of our Genes have two copies, one from our mom and one from our dad. So one of that 23 pair is from our mom and one of the 23 pair is from our dad. So that's kind of the big level, the chromosomes. And then if you look at the chromosomes on a smaller level, um, you see those bands. When you look at a karyotype, the different light and dark bands, inside of those bands are the genes. And 
uh, the genes are made up of the nucleotides, so the, the A, C, T, or G that combine together to make amino acids that then combine together to make the proteins. So the exons are those segments of the protein, of the DNA sequence that when you splice everything together, just make up the protein, whereas the introns are in between those and they are usually have some type of regulatory role. And some of the role we don't actually know. Most of the DNA is introns, not exons. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a whole, like, you know, I forget now the percentage, a very large percentage of the DNA, we don't actually even know what it does. And then there's all kinds of other genomes out there. So there's the microbiome you might have heard about or other, other ohms um, that, um, you know, are probably interacting epigenetically and in other ways with our DNA. So like we know very little. I, the, the longer I was in genetics fellowship, the, le the more I realized we know right. very little about genetics and there's a lot more to learn. But, but those are the tests. What we know now is what the tests are based off of. And when, you, when we talk about SNPs, those are genes that everyone has, but like small variations within a gene the SNP is actually the A, C, T, or G that is in a particular location. So it's within a gene. Um, and essentially a SNP is a location in the DNA where uh, most people have an A or a T. It's like a place where there's one or the other. Um, it's not a mutation. It doesn't affect gene function. But the reason that SNPs can be important is that they we can use them to say, you know, this group of people has this condition and they have this collection of SNPs that are in common. So that helps us sometimes target a gene or a location of a gene um, in research studies to figure out what a genetic cause is for a condition. So it's, it's used on a bigger level to help identify what's going on in particular conditions sometimes. And the last question before we kind of, maybe we can go back to the case after this, but the epigenetics, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and how that interacts with things or how that, um, how that clinically might present? So epigenetics is, is another growing field in genetics. Um, and it's essentially when um, the modifications that are made to the DNA. So the one that I feel like we learn about the most in medical school is methylation. So methylation can affect how genes are turned on and turned off. But there are other types of epigenetic changes like adding sugar groups onto the, the nucleotides, um, all kinds of other things that can happen to the DNA. So conditions in which methylation is important are um, mostly related to the imprinted genes. So imprinted genes are ones in which it matters if it came from your mother or father, because the methylation that happens on the one from your mom is different than the one from your dad. So those are areas where we really just need one of them to work, and one is turned off and one is turned on, and if that is messed up in any way, um, then you may have a genetic condition. And they're usually, so the, the typical one that's on the boards is Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome. So they're in the same exact location on the DNA, but one is due to a maternal uh, methylation or one is due to there being too much of the maternal DNA and the other is due to too much of the paternal DNA. Um, but we're really just starting to learn about all of the ways that epigenetics can affect our DNA. And there's a lot of studies and thought about, you know, distress, add epigenetic modifications to our DNA and result in poor health outcomes down the line. So if, if I'm pregnant and I'm exposed to stress, does my fetus um, absorb those um, epigenetic changes and then, you know, down the line has more hypertension or more diabetes or obesity or other things. And so right. that is something that we actually don't understand very well. And people are doing lots of research in that. But, um, you know, a, a way in which, you know, the, the, the typical story or the typical historical example is the famine in Ireland and how that affected like body mass index and um, the growth of the children that were born sort of after that happened. And a lot of it has to do with epigenetic changes. It's very interesting. Yeah. Isn't there like clinical 
thought that if if there's unfavorable changes, you could turn on or turn things back off to kind of like slow the aging process or reverse aging. That's something that I've heard talked about, in, but more in like pop science. I don't not not from a medical geneticist. <laughs> yeah, the thing the thing that a lot of times you hear about in regards to aging is the t- the telomeres, which are on the ends of the DNA or the ends of the chromosomes, and they are a certain length. And as they get shorter, that's the thought is that there might be some signal about um, you know death and dying related to the length of the telomeres. Um, but epigenetics, I mean, I, I certainly am not an expert in epigenetics, and there's lots out there that I don't know as well. But um, I'm sure if you heard it, there's someone looking into it, doing a study about it somewhere. Yeah. Is there is there available testing for epigenetic? kind of related conditions right now? Or is this kind of more in the research realm? Um, There is testing for like methylation um, focused on particular conditions. So the other one that I see a lot is Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome is also in a methylated area. And so there's clinical testing if you're concerned about that condition. There's not a test that I'm aware of that's just sort of like, let's see what epigenetic changes you have in your DNA because... One, they can change over time, and two, it's, there's not like a clinical relevance to most of them at this time. I think it's time to move on to our to our case. Nora, did you want to do the honors? Sure. So this is our clinical case from Cashlack, um, where Miss Jean Sequence is a 40 year old female <laughs> who comes into the primary care office for her annual physical. Miss Sequence has a history of hypertension and diabetes, currently well managed on medications. She mentions in the course of her visit that her mother has just passed away at the age of 75 after after a multi-year battle with breast cancer. She is concerned about her own risk and her daughter's risk of cancer and would like to know whether she should be getting tested for those BRCA genes. So to start out kind of broad um, and then break it down from there, what are the indications for genetic testing in primary care right now? So that's such an interesting name of this patient. Um, <laughs> so creative. Um, <laughs> I think that's one of Nora's better puns. Uh, yeah, for, I, I would that say that's, that's, that's probably your best. She she usually puts oh. puns in the cases. I think this is her best one. Made me giggle for sure. <laughs> um, I would say that um, there are, you know, the biggest things that. Uh, primary care doctors would sort of ask me my opinion about and are thinking about are mostly related to genetic testing around cancer predisposition. Um, So this case is very appropriate. Um, Other things, you know, depending on their comfort level, maybe um, reproductive carrier screening. Um, There are some uh, pharmacogenomic tests out there where We're doing genetic testing, looking at how your body metabolizes certain medications. Um, There are also some genetic tests that are, you know, for for disorders where we know there's just one mutation or just a few. So um, sickle cell anemia is an example. A lot of the um, hematologic conditions like the factor V Leiden and von Willebrands and these things. Um, Some of the other things like hemochromatosis. Um, those kinds of conditions, I feel like I don't, uh, the single gene ones, I don't typically do testing for because most primary care doctors or other medicine subspecialists are pretty comfortable with doing those tests and they don't really need me to do them. Um, and that's usually because the results are sort of a yes or a no, a positive or a negative. There's not a lot of room for uncertainty, um, which is what adds in a lot of the complexity when it comes into genetic testing. It sounds like there's there's different uh, ways. Like when you when we say as a primary care we want to order genetic testing, I know you can order you can test for BRCA, you can test for hemochromatosis. Those are the ones that I might think to send commonly in my practice. But what what sort of the genome are we testing? Can you kind of refresh us there a little bit, and and maybe sure. I might have some follow up questions based on that too. So the question is, what are we what are we looking at when we test the DNA? And it depends on what test you're doing. Um, so there's I, I kind of think of them as um, chromosomal tests, focused next generation sequencing tests, and then more 
expanded broad next generation sequencing. So chromosomal tests is where we look at the chromosomes. Um, so that could be done with a karyotype where we actually are physically looking under a microscope, taking a picture of the chromosomes, making sure they're all there, um, that there's no big pieces uh, stuck to any other places and no big pieces mixed around. Um, so that's becoming less common of a test to do it. I mean, really, you would do it for certain indications if you're you know, really concerned about like Turner syndrome or Klinefelter syndrome or Down syndrome or mm -hmm. something like that, where it, it would be um, pretty straightforward. Um, the n other chromosomal test that's much more common now is called a microarray or array CGH, which can be used in lots of settings and tumor testing and all kinds of research settings. But when we think about it clinically, we often are, um, what the test actually does is look for with a computer, it looks to see if pieces of DNA are missing or extra. So this is what we call deletions or duplications. And so this is things like DeGeorge syndrome, which is 22Q11.2 micro deletion, which means there's a part on chromosome 22 that's missing on one of the copies. Um, those tests are done very, very commonly now for um, developmental delay, autism, um, other type of intellectual disability, um, um, multiple congenital anomaly cases. So that's a common test that we would use in that setting. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it comes into things like cancer, et cetera, there's sort of, if you know what you're testing for, like sickle cell anemia, for example, there's one gene associated with that. Um, so you, and really with that, there's one mutation. So you would just do testing for that one mutation in one, in that one gene. Um, but most genetics is not like that now. Most things we don't actually, most things are caused by multiple gene mutations. Um, and so with the, the standard for the most part now is panel testing, next generation sequencing panel testing, which essentially just means uh, we're sequencing lots of genes at one time. Um, and that's how the tests are built. So you go to a lab, the way that we decide where, what we're going to do as far as genetic testing goes is we essentially have to search for a lab that will test what we want them to test. Um, so they're usually built in cancer, for example. There's like a breast cancer panel that looks at uh, just BRCA1 and 2. There's a panel that looks at, we call them stat panels, where they're looking at genes that, that would just change management um, of treatment of breast cancer potentially. Then there's ones that look at all genes related to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer. There's colon cancer panels. You know, they're all different. And honestly, between labs, there are differences. Mm -hmm. So the genes that are the most commonly associated are going to be on all the panels at every lab. But there are ones kind of more obscure sometimes. And the relationship to that disease condition may be less well established. Um, so that's kind of what happens with panels. And then the bigger tests are whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Um, whole exome sequencing is where we just look at the exons. So that's the part of the DNA that is just making the proteins. We completely skip the middle part that's the regulatory regions, et cetera. Oh. Um, and the whole genome sequencing looks at all of it. Um, it can also look at uh, other things like deletions and duplications. It can look at trinucleotide repeats. So that's like what causes Huntington's disease. Um, it can, it can look at a lot more things and whole genome sequencing is just now becoming clinically available. It's still kind of expensive. Um, and it's still, it's more, um, research based at the moment, but very quickly is becoming a very clinical test. What's the timeline for getting these tests back in terms of like getting results you can interpret? Uh, it's usually on the order of a couple weeks. Uh, so for, um, for panels related to cancer, sometimes we can get it back in a week. If it's a small panel, small is like 10 genes or less. Um, but usually we say about three weeks turnaround time. Uh, larger panels. So there's some, for example, when I see patients with autism, that panel that I order is over 2,000 genes. And that usually takes six to eight weeks to come back. 
whole exome and whole genome sequencing. There's lots of research studies doing like rapid testing where you can get results back very quickly within three days to a week. Um, but that's very expensive if you're doing that outside of a research study, if you're just trying to order that. And those are usually around the order of a month to two months as well. Let's, let's talk about what the, what the genetic counseling looks like, what kind of barriers there are, how we could remove those barriers in the primary care setting, and what resources are available. It is hard to find genetic counselors. The resource that I use, because sometimes we need to help a family member of our patient get genetic counseling somewhere, is um, the NSGC um, website. So that's the National Society for Genetic Counseling. They have a very easy place on there where you can search based on the type of genetic counseling you're looking for. But if you don't know, you can just put in this, the city and state. It'll look within 100 miles. And you can find a genetic counselor that does what you're looking for. At least you can reach out to them, email them, and say, I have this patient. They live in your area or they live in our area. I don't know what to do. Can you help us? Some uh, genetics in the more of the Western part of the country use a lot of telemedicine. So they do a lot of genetic counseling visits over video or phone. Um, that is possible in um, prenatal genetics as well as in cancer genetics because you don't usually need to do a physical exam. Um, and so it's very easy to kind of get, get everything done that way. Um, but there's a shortage. And, you know, the question you asked me about how can we increase utilization or access in primary care fields is a very big question that we're asking ourselves right now because more and more genetic testing is becoming available it's not necessarily getting that much simpler for primary care or non-genetics professionals to understand. Um, and, you know, there are gaps there. And we don't know how to approach that, honestly. Um, it's why the direct-to-consumer market has become so big. is because there's gaps and people are interested and they, they may not be able to access it on their own. What do you think is the problem for, for primary care? Is it... Is it the way the information is organized? Is it um, is it is it mostly the counseling piece? Is it just a lack of familiarity with like the various terminology that's going to be used on the on the reports that they're getting back? Can you I talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's a lot of things. Um, I think in, genetics is very intimidating for people. Um, you know, you don't learn it very well in medical school. It's something I'm trying to help change. Um, but it's something that's scary, intimidating. You feel like you just need to learn it for the boards and then you can forget it. Um, but it's becoming more and more relevant in the things that everyone, primary care physicians and even other subspecialists do. And I would say that many times, even subspecialists that do a lot of genetics, they're kind of familiar, they talk about it a lot, have some misunderstandings about various things when it comes to testing. So, so that's one, I think it's intimidating. Two, I think, um, the options that are out there are numerous. You can order the same thing from many different places and, it, and you think it's the same, but it may not be. Um, so trying to decide where to order and what to order is complicated. Thirdly, the appointments really to do an effective job are long. It's hard to, in your little short period of time that you have with your patient, really get to all the things we need to get to. So in the pre-test counseling that we provide patients, we besides getting the history of their personal um, history and their family history, which is very detailed, is really talking to them about why someone would do genetic testing. What are the reasons to do it? What are the reasons not to do it? What could you get out of it? What is the uncertainty? What are the types of results we can get? What would we do with that information? Sort of the risks, benefits, and alternatives, but it's detailed. Um, so that is, it's, it's time prohibitive, I feel like in the primary care setting. Um, and then the last thing is that when you get the results back, there's usually a moment of panic because you don't know what you're reading and you don't know what to do. And I would say that the, you know, even if it's, um, uh, you know, positive and negative is sometimes much more clear, but not always, to be honest. And then there's this possibility of finding an uncertain finding, which we call variant of uncertain significance or VUS, V-O-U-S, you may see sometimes in papers. Um, and that's when we see a change in the DNA. We know the changes there. There's a nucleotide that is different than we expect, but we don't know what the consequence of that change is. So 
there's not enough data to know if it actually breaks the function of the gene or if it has no effect at all on the function of the gene. It's just like a normal variation in the population. And those happen frequently and they are continually being reevaluated and reinterpreted. And the concern that I have regarding to VUSs in, in primary care or other fields outside of genetics is that when your patient gets that type of result back, at this time, there is no standard way of communicating if that result changes in the future. So if I have a patient where I do a test on them and their VUS, it comes back with a VUS in the BRCA1 gene, we would not treat that as a positive. We would not say that they have BRCA1 gene mutation. We would say it's uncertain, but what I do in my clinic is continue to follow that. So every year I reassess, I talk to the lab, I look at the data, I decide if that thing is still uncertain or not, which is not something that most other people would do, not most other specialists would do. And at this time, there's no, there's nothing that says the lab is required to reevaluate that or that the clinician is required to reevaluate that or that the patient should be the one reaching out and saying, is this reevaluated? It's, it's up in the air. It's in nobody's hands. And so that can really go missing because about 20% of the time, those uncertain findings do turn out to be pathogenic and would change management. And if no one's following it, it just goes into the abyss and no one ever knows what happens. And that's what gets me concerned about, you know, non-genetics providers um, doing this testing. So I've, I've got a quick question. Oh, hopefully it's a quick question. Only because apparently I had a, a seizure earlier and I thought we had asked this before in a prior show. What, what are your thoughts on direct consumer genetic testing? It's extremely controversial. Uh, I would say in the genetics field, um, I remember going to a conference, American College of Medical Genetics conference a few years ago, and they had sort of a debate. I think 23andMe was sort of sponsoring it. And it was, you know, should you do this? Should you not do this? It was the most like raucous thing going on at, at this genetics conference because it's so controversial. My opinion about it is that the utility of it is, I don't see the utility of it at the moment for clinical reasons. Um, most of the labs test for things that are care, like traits that someone will have. So do you have curly hair or straight hair? Most people know that by the time they're doing the test. Um, what type of consistency of earwax do you have? Are you someone whose urine smells like a some certain smell after you eat asparagus. Um, See, that's a real yeah. thing, Stuart. Yeah, yeah. It is I know. a real thing. <laughs> I know, I know. I, I, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Do men, ha do are men going to get back hair? Very important. That's, yeah. Very the, important question. Does cilantro <laughs> taste gross or not gross to you? Like, so, so the clinical utility of that, I think, is low. There are labs that are, um, that give you more health information and they're, what they're doing is they're not actually looking at a gene mutation. They're looking at SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are all over our DNA. And they sort of are using other genomes um, and traits that people have described to say, is it more likely than not that you're at risk for something? So this happens with cancer sometimes. I've had it a few times where patients will bring me a report and say, this test says that I'm at risk for breast cancer. And essentially what they did is they looked at a bunch of SNPs and compared the outcome of those SNPs to someone else and said, okay, if you have this pattern of SNPs, you may be more likely to have breast cancer, but it's completely useless clinically. Like there's nothing that I can do with that. I can look at your family history and say if you're at risk or not and go from there and do genetic testing from a lab, but I can't do anything with that. And that's sometimes frustrating for patients. The other thing now with direct-to-consumer is, you know, one lab will do um, BRCA testing, BRCA1 and 2 testing, which was uh, something that happened before. Then they were told to have, they had to stop and they started back again. The problem with that is that they're only looking at the Ashkenazi Jewish mutations in BRCA1 and 2. So if you're not Ashkenazi Jewish, that testing is going to be completely useless to you. Um, but you may interpret it as the fact that, oh, I've had BRCA1 and 2 testing and it was negative so that I'm, I'm fine. I'm not at risk for that. And that's actually not true. Um, so there's a lot of questions with some of the labs about how much of pretest counseling is going on. You know, it's online. So you can just click, 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 click and not read anything just like we all do for 
any end user agreement on anything that we ever buy or use on our computers. And, you know, there's a lot of concern that patients may do that, um, not really read it and just want to get to the part where they can get the test mailed to them and and get the results. And that causes some problems sometimes. I think we should go back to to this woman, uh, Jean Sequence, who's very well named. And how would you counsel her about this question? So her mom had breast cancer, age seventy five, or passed away at age seventy five from breast cancer. Should she be tested for BRCA based on that? Before I could answer that question, I would ask her a lot more questions, and this is why genetics appointments take so long. Um, because there's a lot more that we would need to know. So for someone like her, and we get patients like her all of the time, um, I would want to know a few things. I'd want to know how old was her mom when she was diagnosed. It says that she had a multi-year struggle with cancer and she died at 75, but when was she diagnosed? Mm -hmm. Um, What does she know about her mom's cancer? Was it unilateral? Was it bilateral? Did she have one bout of cancer or did she end up having a recurrence or did she end up having a second diagnosis? Genetically, that is a big difference. If you have a second cancer versus a recurrence of cancer, those are two different things coming from a genetics perspective. And a second diagnosis is more concerning than a recurrence of cancer. Um, Sometimes patients are are not sure about the details of their family member's cancer. And so sometimes I ask questions about like, how was it treated? So if they had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy versus a bilateral mastectomy, kind of understanding the time in which they were diagnosed is important. Um, If they know the receptor status, so is it a triple negative cancer or was it receptor positive, which um, usually means that they were possibly offered tamoxifen or some other type of medication after their treatment. Um, so that can give us an idea about this, the severity and sort of um, what the treatment was. Um, and then I usually ask if the, that person who had cancer, in this case her mom, had any genetic testing. Um, because genetic testing has been around now for a little bit over 10 years, and it's possible that she had some genetic testing if she fit criteria at the time. I then would go into asking questions about the whole family. So, um, you know, we do a really, really, really detailed family history, but what I try to tell, so for example, I'm an OBGYN and I see OBGYN patients and my patient appointments are 20 minutes long. So I understand the constraints that happen in my morning that might be different than my afternoon if I'm in genetics in the afternoon about getting a family history. And so some tips that I usually recommend are um, if you tell me that your mom had breast cancer, I ask all those questions I just asked. And then my next question is, does your mom have any brothers and sisters? If so, how many? How many brothers? How many sisters? That gives me an idea about how concerned we need to be. If she had a huge family, 12 brothers and sisters, and most of them were sisters and none of them had cancer, I'm a little less concerned that it might be due to a genetic cause. Versus if you tell me she's had one other sister who died in her 30s. Well, that sister really probably wasn't even old enough to develop a cancer, even if there was a genetic risk. And so I might be more concerned about her because there's just limited family history there. So brothers and sisters, I'd ask about the, her mom's parents if they had cancer. Um, I'd ask about her mom's nieces and nephews um, to see if there's any cancers there. And then usually, because when we think of breast cancer, we're often thinking from a genetics perspective about ovarian cancer as well. Um, we ask about other cancers in the family, but specifically, have any of the women in the family had their uterus removed or their ovaries removed? Um, And if so, why? And the reason we ask that is because if ovaries have been removed or the uterus has been removed, you're obscuring some of the risk there um, because they don't have their ovaries left anymore to develop into cancer. And so that's a little bit important for us to think about. Um, I usually always ask about if someone has passed away, what age they passed away at, because we want to understand if they were old or young and how that might relate to cancer risk. Um, Off. The other thing I also ask about is if there's any males with breast cancer, because that makes somebody very high risk for a genetic reason, um, and we want to know about that. And then 
Uh, the last thing that we ask in relation to cancer, at least, is about ethnic background. So we know that um, for cancer, BRCA1 and 2, for example, Ashkenazi Jewish individuals have a three founder mutations in those two genes that can increase their risk. So founder mutation is a gene, a mutation in a gene that is very common in a particular ethnic group and mostly comes from the fact that that mutation has sort of hung around over time because, um, um, you know, that, that group of people maybe, um, didn't reproduce outside of their own, their own ethnic group, et cetera. There's interesting thing that I learned about after my resident or my fellowship was there's actually a founder mutation for, um, in BRCA2 for patients with Portuguese ancestry. So that's a comp. We have a lot of Portuguese and Brazilian patients in, um, Boston and so that's a very, if I see that background, then I'm also a little bit more suspicious. It's not part of guidelines right now as far as testing goes, but um, if I see a lot of cancer in a Portuguese um, descendant individual, then I'm more concerned. So that's the first thing I'd ask all those questions. Is there a like score calculator that you use to decide whether or not someone needs the genetic testing, or are you just going off of gestalt, kind of high risk? moderate risk, low risk? There is guidelines that are published that are published by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network or NCCN. Um, they have a website, nccn.org. You can sign up for free. You can look at their recommendations for detection um, of high risk cancer. So they have one for breast cancer and one for colon cancer. I would recommend that people look at that. I think they have some very helpful, like one slide that really summarizes everything you need to know about the history taking and what we're looking for there. Um, so that is what we typically use. Um, and then there are calculators that we use like the Gale model or the Tyra Cusick model um, for calculating someone's risk of developing breast cancer. It doesn't help us necessarily decide about genetic testing, but it can let me know if that person's at a higher risk of breast cancer, if they need higher level breast cancer screening or not. How are you going to counsel this patient? Uh, let's say she gets, let's say whatever she tells you about the history, there's, she comes out with that there was male breast cancer in the family and bilateral breast cancer. So All the concerning things. Yeah. So we want to test her for BRCA. It comes back positive. What, what might that sound like? And like, what's sort of the next step from there? Um, so we would get all of that history. And what we typically say is if, if there's someone in the family that is, has a history of cancer and seems like someone that's high risk, they are actually the best mm -hmm. person to test. A lot of times we get patients who are like, my mom had cancer, but she told me I needed to get testing. And we are, we're usually like, no, no, she needs to have testing first because we want to look for the, the mutation in the person who's had cancer. The reason that that's important is that if we get a negative result in an asymptomatic person, we don't know if it's negative because they actually didn't, there wasn't a genetic risk to inherit. And so they didn't inherit it. If there was a genetic risk to inherit, but they just were the 50% because it's a 50-50 chance, uh, they were the 50% that didn't inherit it, or if there's a genetic cause, but we just didn't even test for the right thing. So in order for us to be as reassuring as possible, we want to know that the person who's had the cancer is positive or negative. So that's the first thing. If there was someone else to test, if her mom had not passed away and her history is very suspicious, I'd say I would recommend that your mom get genetic testing. Um, if that's not possible, but she still seems to fit criteria, we would first go into what the testing is. We actually talk about the two-hit hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard of, remember that before, but essentially where most cancers act in such a way that you have to have both copies, the one from your mom and the one from your dad mutated in order for that tumor mm -hmm. to develop. Um, and that that is more, there's more opportunity for that to happen in someone with a BRCA mutation, for example, because they're already born with every cell in their body having one copy of that gene already mutated. Um, and that copy comes from their mom's side or their dad's side. So it just is a, sometimes a matter of time before the second copy in a particular tissue, the breast tissue, the ovarian tissue, the colon tissue, gets this second hit and then uh, can develop into a tumor. 
Um, so we, t- we go through that. Um, in breast cancer cases, we typically talk a lot about BRCA1 and 2. What are the cancer risks? They are, um, for the general population, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is around 12 or 13%. If, some, if a woman has a BRCA mutation at age 50, that risk is about 50%. And in a lifetime, it's almost 90%. So very, very high. We also talk about the fact that there's, um, for BRCA1 and 2, there's a uh, possibility of developing a second breast cancer after the first diagnosis. And so that sometimes is where uh, management of, of breast cancer comes into play, whether someone just does a small procedure like a lumpectomy or chooses to do a bigger procedure like a double mastectomy because of that known higher risk of the second cancer. We talk about ovarian cancer and how ovarian cancer is a rare cancer, but in BRCA1 and 2 carriers can be as high as 50, 60%, depending on which data you look at, and that there is no screening for ovarian cancer. There's nothing that we can really do to pick it up early, nothing that's been proven to help. And so um, recommendations about management, if someone comes back positive, is to actually remove the tubes and ovaries surgically uh, to help reduce the risk as much as possible. Mm -hmm. For people that are still childbearing age and aren't not ready for that, we recommend um, oral contraceptive pills because those have been shown to help protect the ovaries. Um, And as soon as they're done with childbearing, continue uh, consider having the ovaries and tubes removed. Um, and then after all of that, we essentially ask them, do you want to have genetic testing? Cause some people don't really know. And if they say they do, then we get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty about the genetic testing. So what we're actually looking for, I try to emphasize a couple things. One that every gene has multiple types of cancers associated with it. It's important for men and women in the family. Sometimes people ignore the men. They're like, oh, I just have sons, so it doesn't matter. But it does matter because there's male breast cancer and prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer, especially with BRCA1 and 2 that you have to be worried about. So there's other cancers associated. The risk of developing those cancers is dependent on which gene and which type of cancer. Um And often there's options about which test to order. Do you want to be very focused or do you want to do something more broad? Um, And then we actually go into a conversation about the types of results we can get back. So there's a positive result, which means um, you have a hereditary predisposition to cancer. What cancer that is depends on which gene. And we usually have patients come back to talk about that more specifically if they are positive. A negative result, meaning we didn't find any mutations, and depending on if they've had their own history of cancer or they just have a family history, you know, we'll we may get into the caveats of, um, you know, this may be uninformative because you yourself haven't had cancer, and I don't know which of those three situations I described before is the case for you. So, in that case, we would recommend screening based on the family history, and that's often when we do that calculation with the Tyracusic or Gale model. I usually use Tyracusic. Um, and still let them know if they, if they seem high risk, even now with a negative result and need to do higher level screening for breast cancer. And then we talk about variants of uncertain significance. What are they? What is the possibility of finding one? What would we do about it? Um, so that they know that the tests are not just a yes or a no. And th- those variants m- would be in the BRCA you're, like for this example we're talking about, we might get a variant of uncertain significance related to the BRCA gene if that's what we were testing. Yeah. So whatever we tell the lab, we select the test that we want. So whichever set of genes yeah. we tell them to look at is what they'll look at. So if we tested BRCA1 and 2 and it came back with a variant of uncertain significance, that would essentially mean that they looked at the sequence of nucleotides. I usually say the sequence of chemicals to my patients. And um, if there is a change in one of those. If there's something there that we didn't expect to see uh, and the lab is uncertain about the implication of that, they would call it uncertain. And I tell the patient, that's not something that you need to worry about. It's something that I will continue to worry about and continue to follow and will update you if there is an update to be made. Sometimes we can test other family members if they're like, if she had an aunt who had cancer at a young age that she thought really wasn't available and wasn't going to be able to do the testing. We really try to talk them into getting the person with cancer tested. Like we really bend over backwards to make that happen. 
But let's say now she's like, well, maybe I could talk to my aunt and maybe she'd be willing to do it. Sometimes the labs, we talk to the lab about that. Sometimes getting that extra person tested is, and if they also have it is enough to kind of push okay. it over the barrier from uncertain to something else. It, it happens sometimes, not often, but sometimes. Um, and then after going through all of the results, we talk a, b- a little bit about the laws around genetic testing. So there's a law called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, which is a law that was put in place in 2008. And it says that um, medical insurers and employers cannot discriminate against you for a positive genetic test if you have a genetic a diagnosis. But that law does not um, is not in place for disability insurers, um, long-term care, or life insurance. So if you wanted to go out on your own and get a policy, so not a group policy through your job, but just go out and get extra coverage, usually when they do that, they ask you a set of questions, they do blood tests, there's a whole questionnaire around that, and they could ask questions about genetic testing, and it'd be up to you what answer you provide, but they could use that information to change your decide to not cover you at all or change your rates. That's kind of scary. That that was going to be my question. Like, how would they find out? So, as as of right now, it, is the main way they would find out. It, they ask you, and you, it's on the honor system for you to report it to them. Yes, but uh, sometimes they ask for medical records, and okay. so if that was sent with the medical records that were sent to the insurer, uh-huh. then they could see that. If or if it was in the notes from the doctor, or something like that. Usually, consent. At most places, hospitals in particular, there's like a special place you have to mark for like genetic testing, you know, HIV testing, et cetera, psychiatric records. And so there's a special, you have to give kind of special permission to give up that actual report. But if it's in a note, yeah. like if you're, if on your problem list, it says you're a BRCA1 carrier, I mean, they're going to see that. So for individuals who are in the military or have um, military insurance, this rule does not apply. GINA does not apply to those. So it doesn't protect them, you mean? Correct. They're not protected by GINA. Well, it's it's funny that you say that because all of us, uh, so once you join the military, they take a DNA profile and they keep it on file, Mm -hmm. which is, wow. Did they do that to me? I was not aware. (laughs) Yeah, they did. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I I can actually pull up your record and see it. Uh, Well, you... You can send it to me, and I'll uh, let you know. (laughs) Yeah, I am not going to do that. I'm just saying I have the ability to, but I will not do that. Oh, it's spinning out of control. (laughs) Are any of these, uh, like, life insurance uh, disability and long-term? Disability, any of those uh, companies asking to test you in order, like, getting the blood test from you, person, kind of, themselves, or? Not to my knowledge. Um, They're usually doing things like checking your lipid profile and this and that um, for, like, life insurance. But um, I did have a patient who told me, like, they had a family history. His mom had um, a positive genetic test, or she, we knew that she was positive for, I think, a cancer predisposition gene. And he went to go get insurance and they asked about family history and they actually told him if he did not have the mutation, that would be helpful to him in getting coverage because then they would know that his risk was not the same as his mom of getting this cancer. And so um, that I, I, I was like, oh, it's going both ways now. Um, so, you know, the law is there. We don't know if insur- the other insurers are u- using it or, you know, they may not be asking those questions at all, but we talk about the fact in patients who haven't had a history of cancer in particular, we talk about that in detail. So how, Um, what what I wanted to ask next is it it sounds like right now, most of the genetic testing that we're doing is kind of focused. Like we're going to send a colon cancer panel. We're going to test for hemochromatosis. We're going to test for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, breast cancer. Those are some of the ones I ran across in kind of preparing for this. What, the patient that comes to you and is like, I want whole genome sequencing. It it sounds like that's kind of what the direct to consumer testing is where it's going to give you this just gigantic report of all these, maybe they're not sequencing the whole genome, but they're looking at like common things that we've identified that we've associated with either traits or disorders or, you know, I I think they have sickle cell on there and things like things that we know a little bit more about, but 
what what we're interested in as internists is when do you think we'll get to the point where we can say where we can say your risk for heart disease is much higher based on your genetic test you're at risk for these cancers you're at risk for alzheimer's disease does does any of that exist yet and is that are, are there medical geneticists out there that we could send people to like if this this happens sometimes like people will come in my office and be like i want you to test all my hormones and now I know they're going to come in and be like, I yeah. want you to test all my genes. So how do you handle that patient? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we screen our patients pretty, um, you know, we scrutinize you the referrals, not accept to be honest patient. with you. <laughs> Correct. We would, we would go back to the provider and say, tell us how, what you would like to, us to help okay. you with here. Um, but there are patients that we see prenatal. This happens a lot. They'll say, just, just test my baby for everything. <laughs> and it's like, that's not a thing. There's no thing that tests for everything. And the problem with uh, interpreting a test like whole exome sequencing, which is pretty well available clinically in healthy people, is that that's not how the tests are um, analyzed. So when you do whole exome sequencing, you put in a bunch of clinical information. So what are the medical history of my patient, what are the surgeries that they've had, what are the dysmorphic features that they have, what is the family history, and that guides how the lab analyzes the exome. So they look for genes in which those features are present. They also, so that's essentially what they're doing. We're looking for diagnosis. We're not looking for what's wrong with, you know, like just a general, is there something wrong with me? We're looking for a diagnosis of a problem. So that's where it becomes difficult if you look at quote unquote healthy people and try to glean something from that. When we do do whole exome sequencing though, we talk to patients about this list of what's called secondary findings. So it's a 59 gene list of conditions that are probably unrelated to the reason that the person's getting the test. So those are things like BRCA1 and 2, other cancer genes, some of the arrhythmia genes like long QT syndrome and these types of things. And we can give you information about um, if you have a pathogenic mutation in those genes or not. But we wouldn't do that on a health, we wouldn't just do a test on a healthy person for the sake of doing the test. Um, that's if we're doing the test for other reasons and we say, would you also like to know this information because we're looking at your DNA? So that's really the only other time that we're giving a lot of information about um, something really unrelated to the indication for the testing uh, or like completely unrelated to the indication. There's always surprises with the DNA testing. So we talk about that as well. Um, but yeah, there's no like, just do everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I know that that is what some people are going to want. Uh, personally, I don't know if I want to know anything about about my genes. I'm just going to try to, because cause there's, you know, maybe you could argue maybe some people can do something about it. Uh, if you're talking about like mastectomy or, you know, taking out someone with ovarian cancer is taking the tubes and ovaries like you were talking about. But you got to kind of think about what what you might actually do with that information. Yeah. So we have a whole conversation about that's part of the conversation as well is what do you like, what are your motivations for doing the testing and what do you want to get out of it? And let's make sure you understand that that might be something you get out of it, but there might be a whole list of other things that could come from it. And so we commonly get patients for cancer genetics that come in and say, you know, maybe they themselves have had cancer at a somewhat younger age, late forties, and now they're in their seventies and they're like, well, I don't want to know for me. I just want to know for my daughter. Very common reason that people come in and that's fine. And we can talk about how this might be important for your daughter, but you cannot ignore the implications that happen for you, which is that I may tell you that now you need to have your ovaries removed, or now you may need to have extra breast cancer screening or extra colon cancer screening or whatever. We can't ignore that. And, you know, so they need to understand that there's implications for them and then secondarily to that implications for other people in the family. So if, because I know we, we, we've got to let you go at some point. I know you have probably a great dinner waiting for you. It smells very yeah. good, but that's okay. <laughs> and you've been so generous with your time. I, 
No, no problem. Are there resources, let's say a patient comes to us with a question about a specific cancer, what genetic testing is available. As a primary care doctor, are there resources or training that you would recommend we we seek out um, to try to like counsel them? So I would say the resource I mentioned earlier that um, is for sort of looking up what people meet criteria and don't. That's nccn.org. I think that's a good website. There's, like I said, one on breast cancer and ovarian cancer and one on colon cancer. They're very, um, you know, you can find the table that explains, you know, what, what makes someone high risk. So I would say that resource. Another resource, which I think is important for any doctor to know about, because you will have patients that walk through your door with genetic conditions already diagnosed or a family history of genetic conditions, and you may have never heard of it. Um, Gene Reviews, G-E-N-E Reviews.org, I think is an excellent, it's kind of like the up-to-date for genetic conditions or the Google for genetic conditions where you go, you put in a condition, if it's in there, it gives you a nice summary like that will fit on your screen where you can read what it is, what the, what the features of the condition are, what the treatment is, what patient, patients should avoid. It's a really good summary. And then below that, it goes into a whole lot more detail about all of that. At the very end, they put like the molecular genetic stuff. So if you don't care about that and can't read it and don't know what it says, it's very easy to ignore. Um, but you can read a lot about like, what are the, are there clinical criteria for diagnosis of this condition? You know, what things should I be thinking about? There's a section on differential diagnosis. If my patient comes through the door and I think it's this, well, what else could it be? How should I investigate that? Or what else should I be thinking about? And then there's usually a part about resources um, that are usually patient organizations or some type of organization that will have patient friendly material and maybe physician non-geneticist friendly material too, where you can go and look at that and say like, is there something I can print out about this for my patient? So I think that's an awesome resource. Yeah. Um, just, the, I just pulled it up. It's really user-friendly. Very user-friendly. Like you can like look up anything common, like N- neurofibromatosis type one or whatever. You'll find some really, really helpful stuff. The other thing I would say and this sort of relates to the point you asked me before about definitions and that type of thing is there's one website that we sometimes print off for patients, but I think it might be helpful for providers called Genetics Home Reference. Um, so if you go to that website there, and I didn't, actually didn't even know this was on here till the other day, there's like a whole section on like genetics definitions and like basic understanding of genetic tests that you can see there. So I would recommend any of those. I think, um, you know, back to the point about gene reviews, um, when patients have rare diseases, it's really very difficult for them when they go into their doctor's office and the doctor's never heard of it. And is like, I don't know what that is. What is that? It's, they are, have been asked to be the expert on their condition there since they were diagnosed. And it's a very big burden for patients. So I think trying your best to look at gene review, something that's quick where you can at least say you've heard of the condition actually relieves the patient a lot to say, oh yeah, you know, I, I, I've read a little bit about that, or I did read something about that. I think makes them feel a lot better than saying, I don't know what that is. I have never heard of that. And, and they're not expecting you to be the expert, but, um, I think that goes a long way with patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nora, I'm going to say we probably have time for like one more question and then we'll get take home points because we got to we got to let Dallas go. Yeah, the only question that I'm still wondering a little bit about is kind of cost of genetic testing, Um, how how to figure out what different tests will cost and whether things will be covered by insurance. It's um, such a complicated piece of it. And I think another reason why it's good to refer to genetics, if you have uh, that possibility in your practice or in your area, um, it, it changes with the wind sometimes as far as um, what insurers are covering, what they're not covering, um, what uh, lab they are in network with or out of network with. Um, Typically, there are for some conditions like BRCA, for example, there are guidelines as to who 
fits NCCN criteria. Every insurer on their website has their medical eligibility criteria that you should look at and be familiar with if you're going to order this testing so that you know if your patient meets criteria or doesn't. Um, so, and this goes for carrier screening as well. Usually carrier screening is covered, even if someone has no history of any genetic conditions in their family. Um, and so usually in those circumstances, the test is con considered medically necessary. Whether or not the patient has an out-of-pocket cost depends on what lab you send it to, if it's in-network or out-of-network, if they have a copay or a deductible. Um, and that also changes depending on when you are seeing the patient and meeting the patient, et cetera. Um, so patients may, may get a bill. Um, we try really hard to work with labs that will communicate the cost before the, the test is completed so that patients know what that is. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an ever, it's a very frustrating part of what we do. It doesn't, yeah. And it's not just genetics. It's like all of medicine. Like someone's yeah. like, how much is my MRI going to cost? I'm like, I have no idea. I mean, yeah, there's, right. there's some sites that are popping up, but it's still, you know, it's still a ballpark. I probably have a better idea actually about what the cost is than I would for any other test that I ever order for a patient. Like in my gynecology, I have no idea how much a pap smear costs. I have no idea how much an ultrasound costs. I have no idea how much this chlamydia I'm doing on you. I have no <laughs> idea. The genetic testing, I have a little bit better idea. The other thing I would say that patients with Medicare um, will not be covered for BRCA1 and 2 testing unless they themselves have had a history of cancer. It does not matter how concerning their family history is. It doesn't matter if they're Ashkenazi Jewish and everyone but them has had cancer. It is not covered by Medicare. Uh, Medicare, yeah. Um, so that's something to just know because you probably see more Medicare yeah. patients than I do. And the, so BRCA, how much is that, the BRCA testing just out of pocket? Like just if you had to ballpark it? Yeah, so we typically order panels now so we wouldn't just do BRCA1 and 2 but like let's say you had no insurance and the the lab didn't have a, a nice patient pay price and there was no sort hmm. of breaks given it could be $1500 oh, and wow. this is for a breast cancer panel you're talking you said a panel yes. okay yeah and most of the times the labs the panels are all the same price because it doesn't actually change it's not that expensive to actually do the testing it's more about the interpretation that you're paying for um so you can do 15 genes or 2,000 genes. It's usually the same price. Mm. Mm. So if you check off like breast cancer panel, cold cancer panel, like the, 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 however many panels, there's usually one yeah, price. There's usually a comprehensive panel uh -huh. that probably would be a better choice and or refer <laughs> the patient to your local genetic yeah. counselor or geneticist to help with All that. Right. Um, there was one other thing I was going to say about um, cost. Most labs have some type of favorable patient pay price because they are trying to get more pe people tested for various reasons. And so usually the, the labs that we use, um, you know, they will bring the cost down to the patient to something like $250 or $375, something in that, Wait, in that range. Why are they trying to get more people tested? I mean, it seems like it just begs the question. Well, there's data, you know, yeah. why does 23andMe want to <laughs> want you to give you their DNA for $99, $49 during the holidays, Black Friday sale, <laughs> you know, they are collecting data and um, they, I mean, for especially like direct to consumer companies, they can sell that data uh, for lots of money. And so that's part of it. Um, the genetic testing labs are all affiliated with researchers. And so the more samples you have, the more we can learn, really. Mm. Um, but, the, the you know, the sky's the limit sometimes as to what could be done with that information. Well, I think we should ask you for take-home points and then just, like, thank you so much for all the time and teaching. This has been awesome. Um, so my take-home points... Um, are try to find your closest genetic counselor or geneticist resource to bounce things off of to make sure you're doing the right thing. And really, I think for most cases for genetic testing, especially if you get into panels, they are the best resource for the patient. And um, 
you know, we'll get the best outcome. I forgot to say earlier that also some insurers require that the patient has had genetic counseling before they'll pay for the genetic test. And that's like Cigna is an insurer that requires that. And, and United, I think, is moving in that direction. So more and more are uh, requiring that. That seems like just good common sense practice. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, the shortage, like we talked about before mm-hmm. is pro- part of the reason why sometimes that might be hard to enforce. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's important. We think pre-test counseling and post-test counseling are important. Um, the other thing I would say is if you are considering sending your patient to genetics, um, try to get a little bit more information than just, yeah, her mom had cancer <laughs> in her fifties. Try to try to really find, you know, ask some questions to see if there are other people, you know, how how concerned should we be based off of some of those questions I mentioned earlier. Um, and this happens a lot, and I don't think it's on purpose. Um, I think it's to comfort patients, but a lot of times before they come to our office, they've been told that, oh, you're just getting a blood test. And the appointment is an hour long. Uh, or longer, depending on where you are. So we're, we are, the testing is a blood test, sometimes saliva, but we're not just doing a blood test. There was a lot that goes into those appointments and a lot of counseling that happens and a lot of thinking that happens for the patient. And so they need to understand that they're coming in and having a conversation about this. And it's not just like getting a CBC drawn, like we really are going to be talking about some, some hard things sometimes. And patients should, if at all possible, do their homework before they come in to see the genetics professional. So, you know, if they're coming in for cancer, they need to kind of ask some questions of their family about cancer history. And they need to, to see if they can get as much information as possible and as specific as possible. I hear stomach cancer a lot, and the stomach is an organ but to most people, it's a whole section of your body <laughs> with lots of different organs. And so trying their best because, you know, cervical cancer and ovarian cancer are very different from a genetics perspective. So mm-hmm. trying to get as much information as possible about age of diagnosis, what the actual diagnosis was, treatment, all of that can be helpful because when they come to the geneticist, sometimes they don't know they need to know that or that we're going to ask about that. And they they feel really like unprepared and sort of like, well, if I knew you were, you were going to ask all of this, then I would have mm-hmm. asked my family. And sometimes people are calling family members and we're voice, you know, we're doing teleconferences and the appointment and, and whatever. So just let them know that we're going to be asking lots of questions about family history and cancer history, and they should come prepared to answer those questions as best as possible. I think it's safe to say, uh, this will be very useful to the audience. We'll have to, we'll keep in touch. I'll let you know when this comes out and we can collect follow-up questions and see if we need to do a part two or a type of episode that I'm ex- um, I would like to try to do at some point in uh, 2019 is where like we just collect questions and then just like let our guest just like record themselves answering them at their own pace and just say like you know take 30 minutes and answer as many questions as you can or something like that we could try I think you'd be well suited for that kind of thing too like if we had a like specific everyone has a genetic exactly question. yeah yeah I might send in some of my own genetics questions. <laughs> They'll be like disguised. Yeah, genetics. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to be professional and not ask, not ask you them. All right. We'll let you get to your dinner. We'll do like our outro and intro and stuff. And once again, tell your husband, thank you very much. And we, we really appreciate his patience. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> Get show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Mm-hmm. That's right. We're committed to providing you with high value practice change knowledge. And to do that, we need Paul's feedback. <laughs> so please subscribe, rate, and review the show on iTunes or contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com or reach, us, reach out to us on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at thecurbsiders. Thanks to Noro Toronto and to our social media team, Hannah R. Abrams, who still runs the Twitter account, Beth Garbs Garbatelli, we haven't scared her away from Instagram, and Chris the Chu Man Chu is still on ye old legacy platform, Facebook. Until next time, I've been Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. I've been Nora Toronto. And I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. Paul Williams, wherever you are, good night. Good night, Paul. 
Hey everyone, welcome back to the Curbsiders. Meh, what's it, Dad? <laughs> I'm not using that. <laughs> <laughs>